Season 2 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. Given the the strength of the fandom McSweeney's has built up, do you ever just get enthusiasts turning up in a McSweeney's office just needing to stand on the hallowed ground? <laughs> um, I have, you know, in a way, I was just telling you a minute ago that we we had a little uh, security breach, and, uh, and partly that was done, I think, by people saying, oh, we just wanted to see the McSweeney's office, you know. So it does, um, uh, it does attract fans, and um, we try to keep a fairly quiet presence there in that office, actually, but where I really notice is notice that is at, you know, book fairs that I go to and, you know, the sort of public things like the LA Times Book Festival and uh, when we were just at uh, BEA, the Book Expo America in New York, and people really come and seek out uh, the McSweeney stuff. They really love it. And I think partly, especially physically, it's funny, I guess a visit would be the physical manifestation of liking the physical book, you know. Um, uh, You know, I like to think that one of the appealing things to me about coming over to McSweeney's was that uh, I, I think they're making the best case that can be made for the viability and relevant continued relevance of the printed book. Um, so I guess it makes sense in some ways that somebody might physically want to visit there. But, uh, but you know, we're all trying to do work, so we discourage spontaneous visits. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from the Mission in San Francisco, speaking with Ethan Nazowski. He is the editorial director at McSweeney's. Before that, he's been a book editor at Ferrar Strauss and Giroux and at Grey Wolf Press. And I want to get a little deeper into this idea of why why the people who are fans of McSweeney's are such fans. I mean, there's the physic. Is, is it the physicality of your guys' products? Is is it a sensibility thing? I feel free to answer partially. It's a grand question. Not grand as in good. Grand as in too big. Um, I think it's a. It's probably a multiple things. Um, I think even in the early days of McSweeney's, there was a voice that Dave Eggers fostered. Um, that said, we were all part of something larger than any individual effort. And I think that was really appealing to people. Um, um, certainly there was a sense of, you know, kind of an adventurous sensibility aesthetically about the early work. And I think, you know, the list um, very deliberately has gotten broader and more diverse since then. Um, and yet we engage with people, um, you know, through several different magazines at this point, different, many different kinds of books and through a website um, that uh, most other publishers don't have, i.e., one that the public actually wants to engage with. Um, uh, you know, McSweeney's, unlike a lot of other publishers, has a very direct connection to its audience, and I think that fosters some of the kind of fandom that you're talking about. But there is some kind of communication there. Uh, you know, the, the letters pages of the Quarterly and the Believer are opened up to the readers in a way, so there's more of a dialogue possible, I think, with our audience than is um, true for a lot of other publishers. There is a sense in which I can think of a McSweeney's book and get an image, even though the books are all different. But if I think of a Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux book, I don't know that I get a mental image necessarily. I mean, there's that issue of it being having a defined sensibility without, necessar- without it being as defined as we think. Could you say that about McSweeney's? Um, well, there are some things that, uh, that there really was a look to a McSweeney's book. It was in Garamond 3, uh, the typeface, and uh, can, off, usually uh, McSweeney's books don't have dust jackets. Uh, and so there was a lot well, of... They, they don't, you're right. Yeah. I was always irritated by dust jackets. I guess that's, this is the secret to your we, guys' we success. Discovered, we, we discovered that a lot of people don't like dust jackets, actually. And in fact, um, they're an additional expense. So then when you get rid of that expense, you can spend more on embossing or something and, uh, and really, you know... Uh, uh, do things with the printing that make the books look special. So uh, what's funny is that that style has in a way been 
absorbed uh, uh, into the broader kind of design and publishing ecosystem. So sometimes we feel like, oh, maybe we should start doing jackets because we want to not do what everybody else is doing. And if everybody has started doing what McSweeney's is doing, then we feel like, well, we got to keep pushing design forward. Uh, Do you want to avoid pure contrarianism, I would imagine? Of course. And we just sort of want to think carefully about what's appropriate for each book. Um, So we still usually do our books without jackets, but if there's a good reason to do a jacket, then we'll do one. Um, and, uh, you know, Dave Eggers himself started, was, was trained as an illustrator and designer. So it's one of the reasons that so much thought is put into that uh, at McSweeney's. I've never, you know, I've all of the places I've worked make really lovely books and uh, use high quality materials. I've been really lucky that way. At, you know, FSG and Grey Wolf, uh, you know, we don't skimp and we want to make something that people want to hold. Uh, but I've never been in a place where the process is so elaborate and the author is so involved and where we simply don't settle for things that are a B plus. You know, um, everywhere I've worked, sometimes you say, oh, this is pretty good. We can't talk about this one forever. Um, at McSweeney's, we will talk about books forever until uh, the designs forever until we get them right. Uh, and it can take more time and, uh, you know, uh, be a fairly uh, intense process, but then the books come out looking really good and everybody's really happy with them. How different, and I don't want to make this a question about McSweeney's necessarily, but how different is your experience of editing here than it was in publishers previous? Is it like a quantitatively different thing or just, you know, more more of it? Um, Well, the the right answer is that uh, editing has never been different for me any of the places that I've worked, um, that is the one thing that is completely unchanging. Um, and it's funny because when I came over to McSweeney's from Grey Wolf, uh, an agent asked me, oh, well, what kinds of fiction are you looking for now that you're at McSweeney's? And I was like, well, it's not like I've changed my tastes or sensibilities because I've moved from one house to the other. And so you do carry more of yourself with you than maybe someone would suspect. I can't do much more than that. I mean, that's sort of all you've you've got to offer as an editor is sort of your taste or take. And, you know, you find things at the margins that might be slightly different from one place to another. But, you know, what what I'm sort of looking for as an editor in fiction has not changed a jot since I was at FSG when I was, you know, starting at 25 years old or something. Um, You know, I always sort of joke that, uh, you you know, sometimes I feel like the Joe Lieberman of publishing or something. And I say, well, I haven't changed. The industry has changed, you know. Um, And uh, so some of the kind of things that might have been more adventurous that I think um, a place like FSG used to make a a, a regular habit of publishing um, aren't done there as frequently now because they are perceived as too risky. Um, So I'm always just simply looking for things that... uh, um, uh, whose prose grabs me, whose you know approach to narrative is interesting, and that I think readers will respond to. Um, so, in that way, uh, I think um, it's actually been you know one's approach to editing doesn't change at all. I mean, you try to just be an, an author's uh, you know best reader and biggest advocate. I, I want to hear more about the authors you, you have liked to read, but I'll throw this piece of information to the longtime listener. I mean, on the old show, The Marketplace of Ideas, I had Jeff Dyer on, and I recorded with him in Los Angeles, which is the same time I, I met you. You were there, though silent. Uh, the listener will not have known. Um, and you were editing that book, or you had edited that book we were talking about, otherwise known as The Human Condition. And Jeff, it seems, the, what he writes, the way he writes, that strikes me as being, I guess, a, a part of your literary consciousness. I mean, you had this recent interview with him in The Believer that people like a lot. You Obviously, you keep in touch with him. What uh, what about Jeff's writing is, is important to you in the sense of how you think about the possibilities of writing? Well, Jeff is the writer that I've worked with the most in my career, I guess, and also the longest, um, but beautiful. His book about jazz was the second book I published, I think, when I was very young editor at FSG. So it's been a gratifying relationship because um, it was a writer that I immediately responded to when I first read him and um, felt that I identified something new. And um, what that was, what I didn't even know at the time, but it's turned out to be the case, is I like the 
personal and critical voice that Jeff manages at the same time, whether it's in his fiction or in his nonfiction. And it's a consistent kind of voice. It doesn't really matter what genre he's working in. So it was somebody engaging with the culture in a really serious and rigorous way, but in a voice that I felt was generationally relevant to me. Um, and that was, uh, you know, it felt very, really new. I mean, when I, after published But Beautiful, you know, we were um, uh, looking at the manuscript of Out of, Out of Sheer Rage, which was a um, rather contorted process of acquisition. But, um, you know, I immediately thought I'd read something new there. And to me, it was the kind of excitement that I was feeling when I was reading people like David Foster Wallace at the same time. They're very different writers, but um, it felt uh, to me like a new kind of voice um, engaging with literature and culture in a newfangled way, I guess. Um, at that time, Jeff Dyer would have been known only in England, and even then not terribly well known and uh, quite, quite young. Which which would have made what were you twelve years old acquiring acquiring Jeff? I mean, you had to be. This was the very beginning for you. Right? Yeah, I was probably in my uh, late twenties, and I think Jeff was then what I thought was an old man in his late thirties, and um, now that seems really young to me. But uh, but no, he wasn't known then, and he had a few nice reviews. He won some awards and actually really I think it's just the last few years that he's really um, uh, become kind of a, a name I guess tell me a little more about what that that personal critical voice he's developed gave you that you weren't getting before out of the writers you had known before him I mean I'm trying to answer the question in my own head for myself now but what were you, what were you what did you realize you weren't getting from other writers when you began reading Jeff Dyer well, I think there was a certain uh, subjectivity to the voice that didn't feel indulgent and had a purpose. And I think um, the best writers who use the first person use the first person as a device. I mean, I think of, you know, I've said a lot of somebody like Joan Didion where, you know, you read the beginning of the White Album and she's talking about her divorce or something. And, uh, you know, it feels very personal and um, full of kind of revelation or, you know, uh, but if you then later had to describe, after reading that book, what this woman was really like, it, you'd be hard-pressed to say, because the truth is her she uses herself as a stand-in for our the reader's experience of the culture, in a way. And it's just a, it, it's an avenue and a wedge to explore certain questions um, that are bigger than the self. Um, and I think Jeff does a similar thing. I don't think it's a brand new thing. It, it, there were certain ways that it felt newer, and uh, you know, a lot of people think it's indulgent or something. But um, Jeff is all, you know, interprets culture through his own response to it. And instead of trying to remove himself, he goes deeper into his response, hoping that that will reveal something about the thing that he's looking at. But it is not about Jeff Dyer. You know, uh, um, he's again, like I say, a device. And I think that I hadn't really been seeing. I mean, I think especially then during the memoir boom and what's become a, a really kind of sometimes reliance on a diaristic, um, and I mean by diary, not uh, D Y E R istic. Um, uh, I actually, remember that one. Contrast. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to Jeff about that one. But uh, um, things that I think can simply seem like uh, self-expression for its, you know, for its own sake, which I think is really boring, and that is indulgent. Um, uh, you know, when you have something to say that's broader about memory, say in the case of memoir, and I think all memoir is really just about mem memory, then, then it becomes more interesting. Are we still, and I'll ask you this in your capacity as a publishing insider, are we still in the midst of this memoir boom, or has that passed us maybe happily by? I tell you, there's a, an insinuation here that I dislike, and it's... Something I just insinuated? Yeah, a little bit, and it's... Um, a lot of people, will t some people will tell me, oh, I don't like memoir, or an agent will say, I'm so tired of memoirs. I and, didn't say that. Yeah, I know, but, but there is this aspect of, like, are we in a memoir? But I mean, ah, the truth is, there are really bad and boring novels, and I'm really tired of those. And uh, I'm really, and I really dislike indulgent memoirs, uh, or, you know, a, a, you know, another addiction memoir or something. But as soon as, but anybody can make something interesting or new. You know, I edited a book at Grey Wolf, Stephen Elliott's The Adderall Diaries, which is one of my really favorite books that I've published. And it is, in certain ways, a, a memoir about addiction. It's also about a kind of a, a, a murder trial here in San Francisco. Um, but he found an interesting way to write. He had a great writing style. He had a, an interesting approach to narrative in it. And so it was just a good book. And so I think 
you know, this is something that, that Jeff talks about a lot. He doesn't really care about the genre, and I don't either. Like, I don't think in terms of, like, are we over the memoir boom? I just sort of want to think, are we over the bad books boom? And, of course, we won't be because there will always be bad books and there will always be some good books, and the key is to try to find them. The truth is there aren't that many good books. To me, well, when I say something like memoir boom, it's any, any word, any term can precede boom. I, I think of... I mean, the same thing as a, as a boom in certain subgenres of, say, fiction. When, when a type of book succeeds, you do inevitably get the flood of imitators that, that are not so high quality. And that's, that's what I am always glad to be past. Whatever, I mean, something's yeah. always booming in publishing, right? And that, which means something is always yeah, being the, imitated. The Krakauer boom, uh, you know, the Into the Wild sort of uh, book. That is true. Imitators, are, it's always diminishing returns when you start, um, you know, kind of working a line of success. And that's why, uh, you know, actually the first book I published before, But Beautiful, um, uh, was a book called Cotton Side, uh, which was about surfing. And in fact, it was a great way for me to kind of, uh, um, at a remove, uh, return to California when I was in New York as an editor. And it was a really interesting book that was, in some ways, a memoir, but also a book about the history and culture of surfing. It was a really terrific book. And over the years, I continue to get submissions of, of, of surfing books. And I, was, I keep on sort of reluctantly telling these people, I wasn't really that interested in surfing. I was actually interested in this book. And I've already published the surfing book that I'd really like to publish. So, How would you like a lesser surfing book? Yeah, right. Exactly, exactly. I sort of thought I'd gotten the good one. So, uh, you know, you want to kind of keep moving and not just do the same thing again because you've had a certain success with it. It seems like, and I, I don't want to bring up Jeff Dyer too much, but he has, he, he has this sense that he, he moves along subject to subject you know he's yeah he, he finds a subject finds a form for it then moves along from both that subject and form to the next thing you seem to approach editing the same way where you, you, you take on a book and once you've taken on that book you're not going to repeat you're not going to find that form again or that subject again be it surfing or what have you and crank that out it's there's there's a, there's a sort of a rolling stone is in there um, editing at a, at a trade publishing house, and this is what I've always basically done, is uh, a great job for a dilettante uh, because I can just sort of get curious about something and then and then pursue it. I mean, fiction is fiction, but in the nonfiction side, you know, I remember, you know, at FSG certainly, I mean, I edited a book, one of my favorite nonfiction books I worked on was about bird migration, and it was an old-fashioned John McPhee-like uh, story where the author goes from the... Uh, top of Alaska and the tip of South America following migratory routes. Now, I couldn't tell you the difference between a, a thrush and a warbler, but uh, I loved this book. It was fascinating. The science was really great. The writer was terrific. And I learned a lot. So it was a great way for somebody who never really wanted to leave school to stay in school without having to write like academic prose. Right. Right. I mean, I've heard the same things from Jeff about writing. It's like you're, you're, you're almost two sides of the coin. He he the writer, you the editor. It's, you're really the ideal person to be editing his stuff now that I think of it. It's, it's, I mean, it, maybe it's too neat a comparison, but I can certainly see why it's appealing. It, the, the, the dilettante isn't the word I would use, though. I mean, perhaps somebody of varied intellectual interests. I like that. I'll, I'll take that. Sure, sure. I'm, um, you know, I, I'm from a short attention span generation, so I, you know, want to keep... I'm not a rereader of books, actually. I never have been. Um, I know there are some people who who do reread things a lot or find one author and then read everything that that person has written. I'm actually not really that kind of person. I kind of am curious about, you know, I, I guess, um, well, I guess I'm, I'm more of a fox than the hedgehog. Oh, yes. Um, that old, the old Isaiah Berlin yeah. uh, distinction. What, what, other, what other writers, are there other writers you, you, can, you can kind of mark out your career with? Of course, uh, Jeff came on there early and you've edited him recently as well, but are there other names that tapped into your own literary consciousness well and that you have worked with in certain eras of your career all along or what have you? Um, God, there, there, there are several different, you know, at FSG, which was a broader, bigger company, I worked on a, a really big range of fiction and, and nonfiction. And, um, you know, one of the great, well, one of the great <laughs> things about working at a place like FSG is if you stick around there long enough as a, as a young editor, you'll start... Uh, inheriting dead Nobel Prize winners and, and editing their, their, their posthumous works. So, you know, early in my career, I got, I got to edit kind of posthumous books by Elias Kennedy and Isaac Bashevis Singer. And the singer in particular was, you know, he was somebody that I'd read when I was young. And to be able to work on those books when you're older was just a terrific experience. So, and I, I learned a lot from uh, working on those books and working on translations, too. Um, 
but there, you know, there are other authors that I've been able to publish sort of multiple books by, um, and uh, um, I think of somebody like uh, John Haskell, uh, who wrote a book that was actually a little dire-esque called uh, called I Am Not Jackson Pollock, which were these. Um, well, we published them as stories, but they were essays in their way too. And I think for a while I started thinking that um, that this was where the action was. Actually, I continue to think this is sort of where the action was, is, which is sometimes um, fiction that really has sort of essays embedded in it. Um, I mean, this is sort of a DeLillo thing a little bit. Um, and then uh, nonfiction that actually is in, is in some ways very fictional. Um, um, in that case, with, with Haskell, you know, he might get inside Jackson Pollock's head, uh, um, uh, you know, or Rene Falconetti or something, and really bore into a scene. He might recreate it as a scene, but it's really an essay about movie making uh, or about art uh, or about how to live as an artist. And um, so there was kind of, I guess, uh, a nonfiction payload delivered in a fictional frame. Mm. And I think that that's a very, very interesting area now. And actually, we were just talking that, you know, I just had the a uh, lot of fun at the Telluride Film Festival and I saw a new movie by Sarah Polly that's going to be coming out um, uh, in I guess a few months if it gets distribution called The Stories We Tell and I thought it was doing a very similar thing you, it's kind of a self-documentary where there's no way to describe this movie without ruining its its revelations but um, there are ways in which she's um, using um, non-fiction material and fact in a creative and imaginative way and I think that's a um, um, an interesting area. John Degata's work, notwithstanding, I think, uh, who where I think there's, you know, where you're trying to pretend you're a journalist, but uh, and, and want that that validation from journalistic outlets when you're actually making stuff up. I think that's sort of a different, um, you know, there's something else going on there. As a, as a reader, did you already have that dissatisfaction with the Berlin Wall type? genre line between fiction, non-fiction and, and, and all of their sub-genres. I mean, was it, did you have the sense like, this is, this is getting a little too rigid, even before you'd encountered these writers? I, I don't think I did consciously, actually. I think it's something that I started to realize I was being drawn to as an editor. You know, as an editor, you're a little bit reactive. Um, you know, you can only I mean, publish what people are writing, you know. Uh, I mean, you get in conversations with writers and you know, sometimes certain things come out, but but the writers are doing the writing, and I'm sort of saying, oh yeah, that's interesting. And I, you start, and especially after some years in editing, you start noticing patterns, and like you're drawn to certain things. So in a way, it's just you know where my intellectual interests have have um, led me. Which is not to say that I'm not still publishing some very straightforward fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, another book that kind of. Um, did some of this that I published at Grey Wolf uh, last year it was called Red Plenty by the uh, writer Francis Spufford and he and this was a book about the um, post-war era in the Soviet Union where the Soviet economy was growing at a faster rate than the American economy actually and it looked for a moment to people that the um, that, that that system might that the state-run economy might actually succeed um, it was a moment of great hope in the Soviet Union in the kind of uh, you know in the kind of Khrushchev era uh, Francis completely re- does, did, did tons of research, and the notes in this book are like actually almost as fascinating as the text. And yet, he has written these sort of series of linked stories, sometimes completely made up, sometimes based very cl- carefully on speeches that tell not a fictional story because it doesn't rely on plot or even character in particular. Although there are some fascinating characters in it, the story of this book is an idea about the economy, you know, and that's the point. And yet it uses these fictional techniques, which he's very upfront about and explains in great detail. And I found it a great way to learn about something um, in a non-expert fashion. And I wouldn't say that in the, like that that it's a soft fashion, because actually, in fact, some of it's quite complicated. But it is uh, non-academic, I, I, I would guess, and um, uh, and yet still dramatic and actually imaginative and aesthetically rewarding. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. You know, this is just where it went, what what. You know, I, I spend my life reading, and I see all these things, and I think that there are aspects of the kind of psychological realist novel which we've sort of retrenched ourselves in that are very predictable to me. And these books are showing me something that's unpredictable. Um, and I think the only definition of art that's interesting to me is um, uh, is something that delivers an experience of surprise. Um, uh, there can be really good things that are formulaic, and you know, but you're kind of going there knowing what you want. Um, it's not really going to shift your ground. 
provides surprise. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna put that into my own framework about art mentally. I, I, I like that surprise. But it does seem to me that a great many readers these days, maybe it's always been this way, consciously or unconsciously want books that they can feel reassured will teach them something. Uh, maybe that's, if people have swung away from fiction, maybe that's why, or if they've swung toward a certain type of fiction, but is that, you'll know more than I will. I mean, is that a, sense of, is that a shift in sensibility in readers, or is that, have they always wanted books to teach them something, or am I just sort of pulling that out of the air? Do you mean in a didactic way, or like yeah. that there's like a, me- like a, a moral message at the end? Or? Uh, not so much that, uh, that, that. Uh, that's, that seems maybe a little middle ages to me, but the, the, uh, they want to know they're going to learn something factual, I guess. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a vague sense I have, but it seems like, it seems like the, the, the way some books get marketed, I, I, it seems to be playing to that. Like, yes, this might be a novel, but it, this is based on real stuff. You know, yeah. Ian, Ian McEwen did a lot of research into neurosurgery for this book, and you, he's going to pass it along to you. Well, that's interesting. I haven't really thought about that. I mean, I think there are a couple of things to say. One is that... Um, you know, we definitely live in the information age, and uh, people are trying to kind of pick up stuff wherever they can. Uh, some of it, I think, is sort of a publicity pitch, and that it's easier to get attention for nonfiction, and you know, uh, out of the book review pages. Uh, so it could have something to do with that. Um, um, I don't. I don't think I have a strong feeling. I, I'm not sure. I totally agree with that. I'd have to think about it more. Uh, um, but uh, maybe that is sort of some American thing that no time should be wasted. So even when you're getting your kind of imaginative and spiritual uh, uh, tank filled, that you can at the same time, uh, you know, in this sort of, uh, uh, you know, American efi- efi- efficient w- this way of American efficiency, um, learn something. Right. Plus we can do it while we run on the treadmill. Yeah, right, right exactly. It's definitely multitasking, yeah. It's, I wasn't. I, I hadn't even thought of it in American terms before you said that, but now I am. And it's probably, it's probably right. Actually, it yeah. does feel American. What What can you say about? I mean, when you have conversations with your colleagues in other parts of the world, editors elsewhere, about. I mean, what What have you learned? Is what What have you learned about American readers that that, that makes your job different from theirs, if anything? Oh, dear. Um, I would say um, I think that American fiction is probably less risky than uh, a lot of European fiction. Um, I think there's a little bit more room for experimentation. That said, depending on the country, some of, that, some of their experimentation is feeling a little bit old, uh, so it might sort of seem um, adventurous, but it's maybe adventurous in a way that's been adventurous for 20 or 30 years, i.e. not very adventurous. I think of, I think of, for example, oh, French publishing. And maybe this is just being American and literarily minded, but the automatic assumption is like, well, they must be doing something better in France, but, or more, ex- more experimental, more adventurous, but you just look at the physical books themselves and it, it seems like things have almost gotten comically rigid over there. You, there's probably a lot of fascinating things going on in the text, but there's there's really no McSweeney's of France, right? Not that I know of, although actually we do sometimes find um, partners at countries abroad who, who do look to McSweeney's as a model, I think in terms of design. I mean, I think it's one of the few publishers that is known sometimes as much for its designs as, you know, for the actual stuff that's in between the covers, you know. So um, I think especially in the kind of more anxious electronic age, uh, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, we got to give people some value for their money if we want to keep giving them printed books. And so, I th- you know, I- I'm fairly new at McSweeney, so I'm just sort of learning my interaction with foreign publishers. And um, But there are a lot of people, a lot of partners abroad who will publish sort of anthologies of, the, of material from the quarterly or what have you. And um, I think that's both because of the quality of the writers that appeared in the quarterly, especially... Um, and also because of the look of the books that has been influential now internationally. You grew up here in San Francisco, went off to work in New York publishing, and have come back. Uh, tell us about that homecoming. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I grew up in this really terrific uh, city that I always adored, and I didn't leave because I was bored of it. I just left because I wanted to see something else. 
And um, I actually went there for college initially and then came back to the Bay Area for grad school at Berkeley. And when I, I, when I realized I didn't like grad school, which I really didn't like grad school. It's not uh, for everyone. It's not for everybody. Um, actually, what happened is I was working at a really amazing bookstore in San Francisco called Green Apple while I was finishing my master's thesis on a uh, sadly overlooked and forgotten proto-beat poet named Kenneth Rexroth. Uh, yes, yes, I know, I know him. Not yeah, personally, well, he he's dead. He was a Santa Barbara teacher for a little while, actually. Um, uh, but poems about Japan, as I recall, a specifically. Lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, when I finished grad school and realized that I really liked what I was, my the dialogue I had with people in the bookstore was more um, enriching for me than the dialogue I was having with my colleagues in graduate school. Um, and it seemed like there were three choices uh, for a guy like me, which is I could either write, and at that point I discovered I really wasn't the writer. Uh, I could uh, teach, and at that point I my passion for reading wasn't something I felt I could convey. If I was confronted with a student who told me, why do I have to read this? I didn't have a good answer for them. I think I have a better one now that I'm older, but at the time when I was 25 or whatever, I didn't, didn't feel like I had that answer. It just was too personal and private to me. Um, uh, or I could get into publishing, and that sort of seemed like the, the sort of bright light of possibility for being able to make a living, even if it was a modest one. So I went to New York, uh, back to New York, and um, got a job there as uh, an assistant at, at FSG. And then I just stayed in New York because that's where all the jobs were. And I loved New York, and, and all my friends were there for a long time. Um, but I always had this vague idea that I'd like to come back to San Francisco. Um, I like it here, and my family is here. Um, and I'd hit this terrifying hinge where I'd, I'd discovered one day that I'd, I'd spent as much of my life in New York as, as I had in California. And, and, and having still identified as a Californian, um, I started to panic a bit. But also my wife and I decided, you know, who's also, my wife is also from the Bay Area. We decided we wanted to come back out here. And uh, happily, I was working for Grey Wolf Press at the time from New York. And... Uh, uh, the publisher, Fiona McRae, who's a terrific publisher, um, sort of said, well, if there's one other place you could be of use to us, it probably is San Francisco, because there are really so many writers here and so many great bookstores that we like working with, and, um, you know, authors we have authors coming through here pretty regularly, and uh, so she provided that flexibility for me to come back out here. Um, so I was excited about that. Um, that said, I got out here and discovered I'd become so much of a New York publishing type that it that it took really a full year to me for me to kind of readjust to the pace. What what did it feel like initially? What was what did feel like such a lurch when you got back from New York? Well, um, there wasn't as there's no publishing or media community here, so the the um, uh, I mean there are a lot of writers here, uh, but I think. Um, a lot of the writers who live here um, come to San Francisco not to be a writer, but they come here because it's a really nice place to live. Uh, whereas New York, I think a lot of people go there to be a writer or to be a publisher or something. And so there's a lot of energy around the publishing community there. And the other thing is, is you have these thousands of young people in New York who provide a lot of, the, as it turns out, I didn't really think about this until I got out here, who provide a lot of the audience for book events and intellectual events uh, because it's part of it's part of their profession, you know, and they and they uh, go to things because they're interested in them. There's a there's a smaller crowd there's a smaller crowd out here for these things, and um, you know when I was uh, when I first got out here, actually, it's fun, you know, I was still working for Grey Wolf, not McSweeney's, but I went to uh, a reading at Amnesia, the bar next to McSweeney's, for a launch for the new issue of The Believer or something. And uh, there were some people reading there who I knew, writers that I knew, and I knew, you know, I'd met a couple of people who worked at McSweeney's, and um, anyway, I got into this bar, and I was pretty new out here, and I felt like, well, I'm working for Grey Wolf, I have to make the scene and make sure, you know, try to meet people, and anyway, I walked in this bar, and I was, uh, I'd been here only for a couple of weeks, and I, I looked around, and I had a drink in my hand, and I thought, oh, this is great, this is a totally familiar experience. I've been to a million boring readings just like this one, and I feel just fine here, you know? And uh, uh, It feels like home. Well, it feels like, but there was something kind of different, and I couldn't quite place it. And um, I kind of looked around, and I said to myself, and then I was like, oh, there are no agents here. And 
And I was like, oh, and there's no kind of hustling young reporter from the New York Observer wondering, you know, what Sam Lipsight just said. And uh, and then next week, there's going to be no kind of lazy culture editor at the New York Times reading the Observer story and saying, oh, that's a national story. So, you know, the whole kind of media echo chamber, which was an ecosystem that I learned you know, pretty intimately in New York. You can, you can spot an agent across the bar, you though. Totally can, really? yeah. But I just uh, no, not really. But I just there were, were people that I knew, and um, uh, but that whole echo chamber or ecosystem, if you want to uh, um, be more generous to it, does eco exist. chamber perhaps. Eco, eco chamber seems great. You know, it's funny. I when I was young and writing about Rex Roth or whatever, I uh, you know, of course, adopted the West Coast paranoia of the East Coast literary establishment as some horrible thing that existed. And then I went there and discovered, well, indeed, it does exist. Um, and I became part of it. And um, I don't think it's entirely evil, but it is its own little bubble. And um, uh, so I'd say that on the plus side out here, that the thing that's good is I think, well, it's a much more collegial place. I think uh, New York can be incredibly competitive among, among writers and within publishing companies. And uh, um, I'd say it's a very friendly place for writers and the people who are in publishing here. Um, the advantage is, is that I think people can sort of work in peace and uh, happily and maybe do things that aren't, uh, you know, that might be more adventurous or just different than what's going on somewhere else. The flip side is it can be hard to get traction for really um, interesting stuff that's going on out here just because it's not written about as much in the national media. So that's uh, a frustration in certain ways and a benefit in others. What are the cultural sectors that drown out uh, literary type happenings here in San Francisco? I mean, what does have primacy if, if it's not writerly type stuff? Well, no, I mean, there's tons going on. There are th- hundreds there's, of There are tons going like, on, yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's, is there some other... Are there other areas of culture that just happen to be more dominant? I don't think so. There's just simply not as much of a density of cultural activity. I mean, I remember when I first started living in New York and loving it. I mean, I was sort of thinking, oh, well, you know, at any t- given time, there might be, you know, one excellent show here to go see at, 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 at a museum, at an art museum, a visual arts show, or there might, you know, obviously good movies playing in great repertory of film houses. But, um, but there are like 10 of those things in New York. There's just a greater density of it. And that, that amount of choice um, adds to a very rich intellectual culture there. Um, and I think there is one here. I mean, I think right now, well, actually, I'll tell you what drowns out a lot of cultural activity generally here. I think a lot of the energy in the Bay Area right now where there's innovation and interesting ideas are in two sectors, food and technology. You know, I'm, I mean, that's where I think a lot of the kind of hot ideas and, you know, that are areas that are leading the country and, you know, countries following, you know. Um, I think that can happen in a quieter way. You know, there might be a writer out here that people really pay attention to or that's really good. But I think in terms of a broader subject or area, um, you know, those are the two areas, those are the two things that I'd say California and the Bay Area are leading on. When I talk to writers or other literary type people in Los Angeles or who, who are based there, they do tend to bring up the fact that the, they can find some discomfort in New York because of the primacy of publishing and writing and, you said, the competitiveness, although... Now, if coming out of my mouth, it sounds like me speaking cliche, like, in a cliched way about New York, how competitive. I guess it's true. Um, but the, the sense that there's thousands of other writers clawing their way up at you from below. Uh, the, the writers I talked to in Los Angeles are happy that the, the that that pressure is off in some sense there. So, me, meaning I guess you can confirm the pressure is seemingly on in New York. Well, the other way to talk about this is in terms of ambition, actually. And I think ambition can be really good for one's one's practice, actually, because you keep pushing yourself and you have other people pushing you really hard. Yeah, and um, some people really respond to that and it, they work well and some people get crushed by it. So it's sort of not for everybody. But the thing is, it doesn't really have to do with publishing. I think New York, and it is about, New York's ambition is not about money. Um, it's about it's about an achievement. You know, you can get somebody who goes to New York because they're interested in bottle cap collecting, and they can say to themselves, "Oh my God, I am going to be the best bottle cap collector in the world." And they will learn every single angle of it, and they will live it. One, you know, twenty four hours a day. Um, that can become really rich, and it can burn you out. You know, um, but uh, there are certain advantages to that all consuming approach to one's work or craft or what have you. And as I say. It's not really about power or money, but it is about ambition and achievement. Mm. And I can see the yin-yang to that. I mean, there's 
you, you're, you're pushed along by us, but there is another force that uh, compresses you down as well. I don't know, what, what, are, you, what are your... Is there, is there anything you miss at this point in your career about working in New York, or was it like you got you got the momentum you wanted from New York, and now you can go to San Francisco and you know live well in a school? Yeah, I mean that that's very true. I mean I, I'm really glad I spent my 20s and my 30s in, in New York, and I learned a ton. And it's easy to learn a lot there because the the industry is there. I mean it would be like you know there's a there, there's you know great film stuff going on here and or in you know other parts of the country but you know Los Angeles if you're interested in commercial film world say is you know there's going to be so much more to learn and do down there it's just there's just a great, again it's this issue of density um, if i meet somebody really young in San Francisco uh, who has invite you know we have interns at McSweeney's or what have you and we have very few jobs that open up it's a very small company and um you know, so we have these people who come through on internships, they get interested in publishing, and then they ask for advice. And, and unfortunately, even though, and I think this is good, I think this is really good, publishing is getting decentered in, in certain ways. Um, for somebody really young, I would still tell them that if they're really interested in publishing as opposed to writing, or you know, uh, I would tell them to go to New York still. There are more jobs. They'll learn more. Um, and for the foreseeable people who want to be an editor like you, for yeah, example, yeah, I, I still think that, again, there's just more possibility. There are more, there are more things to do. Uh, um, for me, it's just I feel really lucky because I did, you know, go get all of that experience out here, and then I, you know, am able to work at this, you know, really amazing uh, company in San Francisco. And uh, um, but that there aren't that many positions like that here. Uh, so I, I don't think that's a good thing. I wish it were more. I, w- I wish there was more. And I, you know, there are there there are other places here. But they're very small. You know, there's a great literary magazine in Ziziva here. There's Three Penny Review in, in in Berkeley, run by Wendy Lesser and exactly one half time assistant. You know, and so it's a it, you know there's Counterpoint in Berkeley and uh, you know and City Lights in San Francisco. It's a, it's a, but these are all pretty small companies. So there aren't as many jobs for people who are interested in it. And that's you know that's no good I think for the culture or the country. I mean if you look at Germany there. There are several cities where publishing lives. I mean, it's you know, Munich. I hear they do things differently there, in publishing wise. Well, they do, and but it's you know, there there are publishing companies in um, Frankfurt and Munich and Berlin, you know, and Hamburg, you know, and uh, these are all viable places to live. And um, there, I think it's getting better in the United States, but it's still you know, outside of New York, the companies are quite small. You mentioned the reacclimation you had to do coming back here to San Francisco after New York, but I do wonder in, in New York, were you? known as the Californian up until your final years there, or did, did you become it, becoming a New Yorker? I mean, how quickly does that happen? Well, you know, my, my mother was born and raised in Brooklyn, so I always had some ties and affection to the place. Oh, legacy, and, uh, a legacy New Yorker. I think I worked, I, you know, initially I walked to people in California. I walked very fast when I was younger, but then in New York I seemed very slow. So, um, you know, I guess I landed somewhere in the middle. No, no, I, I think the, my identification as a Californian was probably more internal, although, um, uh, you know, when I was at FSG, I did sometimes edit books that were about the outdoors or that were kind of, there was a great, um, rich vein of uh, nat- natural history and um, writing on the North Point imprint at, at FSG that I worked on a bit. And, uh um, that was so I did have these kind of interests uh, in the West, and I, you know, would sometimes kind of try to uh, live vicariously through the books I edited. You know, I edited a book, um, a memoir by the wife of Edward Weston, uh, Karis Wilson, who was um, the subject of like more than half of Weston's nudes, and she, that was an amazing book for me to work on because it was great to read about kind of California bohemia in the 30s and 40s, and she was just an amazing character, and uh, so that was always fun. I mean, I always had this kind of tropism to the to the West, and I remember when um, when I was a fairly young editor, the New Yorker did a California issue, um, and uh, a friend of mine who worked in the in the uh, media department there was really curious what I'd what I'd think about it. This was in the heart of the Tina Brown years, oh, and yeah. and so she kind of messengered me over a copy of the issue on a Sunday or something, and and I immediately read it that night, and I was just horrified, you know, because it was all Hollywood, I thought. I mean, there was actually an amazing Gene Stein piece about the Warner uh, the Warner family, kind of a bit of work of oral history, and there was a nice piece by Lawrence Weschler um, about light in California, but other than that, it was kind of all Hollywood. There was no Northern California, as though it didn't exist. Oh. 
and um, you know there was no sense there was no Joan Didion in there there was no idea that Susan Sontag was born in California and, and lived there you know as, as a kid there was no intellectual heft to it and there really is there, there is stuff going on out here and there's a great and rich history there was no Weston you know there, were, there was no uh, you know all these things that to me um, give ballast to the place and are and enrich it um, that wasn't reflected there so I was always resentful or annoyed by the um, sense that the only things that were relevant were happening around New York. When I was very young, I was asked to um, edit a book about, um, well, it was, it was a natural history of Long Island Sound. And I uh, wrote, and, and my boss asked me to write, a, you know, look at the manuscript and assess it. And I said, oh, it's good. You know, I need this work and that work and the other work. And, um, and I said, and this was when I was really obnoxious as a Californian, and I was still pretty young then. Um, you know, I said, but, you know, if I'd brought you a natural history of San Francisco Bay, you would have told me, um, well, there are a lot of wonderful regional publishers who could do a nice job with that book. Why, why should we do it? But so why should we do this book? Because it takes place in Long Island, like 100 miles from where all of us work, or less. Um, and... My boss smiled uh, patronizingly at me, and like he's like, you know, kind of like it's all well and good. Sure, sure, go ahead and edit it, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, so there, you know, New York, New York is its own bubble. It's a big bubble, you know. It's a very big bubble, but it is it is one, and I and it was something that I responded to, and so I always, you know, wanted to work at least on some books that reflected the place that I knew and grew up in. And there are some things about you know this stuff has now really been absorbed in the culture entirely, but when I was working on the North Point list, which FSG had bought, you know, it was a California publisher that um, got sold to FSG, mm-hmm. and the stuff that Jack Shoemaker was doing at North Point in the 80s um, and going into the early 90s, that combined an interest in um, food and natural history and Asian religion, none of that stuff seemed strange to me as a kid growing up here. That was all, you know, that was part of both the Epicurean and outdoor culture that, like, and, and intellectual culture that you know, wasn't forced or weird, and those, but those kind of breathe it. Yeah, and those kinds of books weren't strange at all to anybody out here. But that, that, a lot of that stuff was new to New York publishers and became very successful in the '90s. Um, so, um, but that kind of mix of culture I really like, um, and and I think still exists out here. Um, there's, a, there's a diversity of culture that I like. You mentioned the the bubble of New York, though a large one, and. I, I hear San Francisco described in the same way, or, or the Bay Area, as having a bubble around it. Both, both places, for for both good and ill, have that. You know, the bubble gives them strength, but the bubble is also. I mean, there's a, there's a downside to it as well, right? I mean, Colin, you, you've Colin, been, are you trying to point out that we're provincial up here? No, I mean, <laughs> I, I realize that's. A, I didn't realize that there there is a sensitivity to that possible charge here in the yeah. Bay Area because I'd never thought of it as provincial. But you know, the, what I'm saying is the you know, the bubble. If we're talking about a Bay Area bubble, it, that's what makes the place good. But, I mean, there's, I guess there's, there's got to be a dark side to that as well, right? I, I don't know. Sure. Well, you know, um, I'm just the fish that swims in this water, so it's hard to tell you what the water's like. Um, uh, you know, I think I became more aware of the New York bubble as, like, as I, after I left it. So um, now I'm really happy to be in the little Northern California and San Francisco bubble. But I'm sure, I mean, it's a small city. It's a cosmopolitan city, but it's a small place. So it's always going to, you know, have that quality to it. And it's a very proud place. I think of, actually, I, I spent a little time in Barcelona after graduate school. And, and it reminded me a lot of San Francisco, of this um, kind of, um, well, it's this, very, it's a small but cosmopolitan city oh. on the water with mountains behind it um, that is overshadowed in some way by the capital city and has you know has a sense of kind of um, chip on its shoulder uh, you know resentment of the of the of the capital. And I yet think. people really love both cities yeah. all over the world. They're like they're the, gorgeous cities, right. and uh, uh, sure, I mean San Francisco. You know, let's be objective here. San Francisco is the most beautiful city in the country. Um, we say that objectively in San Francisco, and so you know you become self satisfied and proud of these things and. Uh, uh, um, so, it's a little uh, like the British Columbia license plates up in Canada that read "the best place on earth." Yeah, right, flatly. Right, right, except that except that this is yeah, so. Exactly. Um, so there's a, those there's are a wrong, of course. There, you know, yeah. <laughs> so one 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 fact of the matter here is that uh, since you handed me a copy of David Byrne's "How Music Works," there's a part of my mind is just devoted to me being excited to open that book, and it, I, I I will have to resist opening it this whole trip because I've got so much interviewing to do. 
And people are excited about the book in general. Uh, I've been hearing buzz. Tell us about this book that McSweeney's is about to put out. Yeah, well, this was um, <laughs> this was a great, great good fortune um, for me. You know, I walked in the door from one quite small press to another quite small press. But um, the nice thing about McSweeney's is every once in a while there's some big, splashy books that you get to work on. Um, so I walked in the door and was immediately wrapped up in the publication of both, in the kind of editing and publication of both David Byrne's How Music Works and Dave Egger's new novel, A Hologram for the King. And these were, like, huge books. Uh, uh, so it was very exciting. And when I came in... Um, uh, Byrne's book, uh, you know, was still in manuscript and needed work, and that was um, it had come to us through, you know, Dave Eggers has known David Byrne for a long time, and they'd been, I think, talking about the possibility of doing a book, mm. and um, you know, Byrne's a guy who, you know, frankly, could have gotten a lot more money from a from a you know big New York publisher, um, and I think was happily published by Viking, you know, for the Bicycle Diaries. But he also knew this was a book that um, he'd been working on and thinking about for a very long time that was going to have a complicated design. And he knew that McSweeney's would um, pu- publish and print it in the careful way that he wanted. So, you know, a few weeks after I got in the door, I had the great privilege of sitting in a meeting with David Byrne and Dave Eggers and our art director, the kind of genius art director, Brian McMullen, mm-hmm. and watching them just pass books and material back and forth and talk for a really long time about what the book should feel like and look like and all of these things. And it was, um, you know, at McSweeney's, these things are really harmonized. It's not just you have a book and then you send it to a designer and they slap something on the cover. It's really like what is the right, the proper physical expression of the contents of this book. So that, you know, was a long process and really great. The book is, um, you know, I was sort of telling you earlier uh, you know, we all kind of say it McSweeney's very honestly. It's kind of the book that you want David Byrne to write. It's a really kind of eggheady book about music, um, going from the business of it to, you know, where he open, literally sits there and op- opens up his own financial statements and books for an album that he did and shows you how different distribution channels would have affected what he earned. And so it's, you know, I would think that that would be initially when I saw that that's what the chapter was going to be about. Um, I thought, oh, this is only going to be of interest to bands, you know, to aspiring musicians. But actually, I thought it was a really interesting um, uh, uh, chapter about business generally and about how culture is uh, transmitted to the public. Um, But it also kind of ranges widely. There's a whole chapter on the history of recording technology and how that changed what music was produced. And similarly, the first chapter is about architecture and how the um, interior space or exterior space, if you're uh, playing outside, um, changes the kind of music that gets produced there. So it's a book about context. Um, In a a lot of ways, it is a um, a sly assault on the romantic ideal of the artist as, uh, uh, of the artwork as emerging out of a passionate moment from the artist's head. Um, it's time to assault that, I think. Yeah, well, it's you know, it's a kind of you know, it's it's a, I don't know if you've read Lewis Hyde at all, but he kind of um, um, uh, has written a lot about this about Thoreau, especially as we think of as the uh, isolate thinker or writer. But actually, Thoreau emerged out of a system of support and community, um, even if he was sitting in a pond scribbling, you know. Um, and that was as essential, I suppose, as the community, as his moments of isolation. Right, exactly. But that these things are interdependent in a way. It's not, you know, Burns not making this argument that the artist didn't write their music, you right. know, in some way. Sure. But uh, uh, but just that it, it, it emerges from a very, it, both the, the, the form it emerges and even the way it is distributed comes out of a cultural context. And sometimes a techno- and that includes technology. It is... An exciting idea to me. I mean, I read Bicycle Diaries that Viking put out, David Byrne's last book, and that, to me, was one of the most compelling books I'd read in in years. I'm sure How Music Works will displace it entirely. I'll forget there ever was a Bicycle Diaries. But in Bicycle Diaries, David Byrne universalizes. It's it's not for cyclists, necessarily, though cyclists find it interesting. And as you said, it's not musicians, not just bands or people aspiring to be in the music industry or already in it. It's, It's universalized. You wouldn't necessarily expect that from somebody not known primarily as a a writer of books, right? That they can universalize? Or would you? Is that that exactly what you would expect from that? Yeah, well, I think a guy like um, 
like Byrne uses his personal experience to again, you know, this sort of something we were talking about earlier to kind of explore the, the the broader world. And he's got really varied interests. You know, it turns out Bicycle Diaries in a way is not about bicycles, but partly about urbanism. You know, and about you know he he really deeply believes in um, that in kind of a mode of transportation as a way of experiencing cities. And he's interested in how cities work. And there's a chapter in the in the in the new book called How to Make a Scene, and it's about like why kind of. Um, uh, cultural phenomena, like what, like kind of rich, intense scenes emerge out of it, out of out of season. Like what, what, what is the basis? What, what, what are the necessary and sufficient qualities that that, that contribute to that? And that kind of is just another way of his talking about urbanism. You know, um, he's really interested in art. Uh, he's interested in community, and so he gets to talk about all of these things based partly on his own experiences, and he draws on them to illustrate broader broader points. Um, I think. You know, it comes, it comes back to something else we were talking about. It's a friendly way to talk about kind of serious subjects, um, is using sometimes a kind of a first personal or anecdotal or autobiographical voice to explore, um, you know, really serious subjects. You called it the book that you want David Byrne to write, or that one wants David Byrne to write. Whether there are writers you, you work with or don't work with or just read, do you have more of these in mind, the books you would want certain authors to write? Do you think of a name and you, th- you think of people you read and you think, I want this guy to write this book? Uh, whether or not they've done it, I mean, is that, is that a way you think about, about writers, that there are certain books you know you want them to write? Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but the desire is there as a reader for a specific thing, a specific project from them? I had a, um, a really paranoid friend that I, I wanted who was interested in surveillance, and I really wanted him. To, he's, a writer, he's a writer, but I, I really wanted him to do a book. Do, I don't, do you remember Fifty Simple Things You Can Do to Save the Planet or Save the Earth or something? Oh, this I was think a big, I did hear of that. It was a huge bestseller in like the eighties or something, and I wanted to do something like Fifty Simple Things You Can Do to Protect Your Privacy, and he just never. He didn't think I was as good as I thought. It was a brilliant idea, but like uh, he didn't think it was such a good idea. But uh, yeah, it does happen sometimes, and um, that's actually can be the best way to be an editor instead of. You know, it's the one way you can stop being passive as an editor and you can kind of have an idea and try to match with the writer. I think magazine editors do that often really brilliantly. Um, It it can happen with books that get, that get suggested as well. Um, So um, uh, nobody else is coming to mind immediately, but no, it does happen. I think with Byrne, what I meant is that, you know, he's not Keith Richards. He's not this like all over the place kind of guy who's going to tell you about, you know, like kind of in some really dishy, um, gossipy way about like you know the, the Rolling Stones history. Mm-hmm. Byrne is, is is well, he's more serious than that. You know, he's more of an intellectual, and so it, it, it's um, um, so. And it was what I meant by that is he's going to, um, even though he does tell lots of anecdotes in the book. Um, it, it reflects 40 years of this major cultural figure and musician telling us what he thinks about the thing that he knows best. So that's sort of what I meant about that. And so it really feels like the summation of this really big and diverse career. Mm. And but it's not a memoir. It's not a memoir. So right. people who are looking for kind of like talking heads gossip aren't going to get it. Yeah, and people who have been wishing away memoirs for years, it's yeah, don't yeah. worry, it's not a memoir. There's something that came up well, last time I had Pico Iyer on the show, um, and he's often thrown on panels with Jeff Dyer. We talked about that off mic earlier. Uh, and he, he, he and Jeff, maybe you know more about this, but they, they share the same publishing professional on some level. There's, there's one guy who does some sort of editing for both of them, uh, or that they both pitch things to. Is that a Pantheon? Was that their editor, Dan Frank, or somebody else? I, I, I don't want to make any guesses, yeah, but they do. There's someone that they both... But they both send their ideas to um, that they have in common in publishing. And Pico had pitched the idea of a book on being a living as a happily befuddled foreigner in Japan, which he does half the year. And uh, Jeff had pitched the idea of a book on tennis, which was at that moment an especially big subject. And then they proceeded to actually write and turn in on Pico's part a book on his father and Graham Greene and Jeff a summary, an extended summary of uh, Tarkovsky's film Stalker. So this, this switcheroo that authors can pull. I mean, as a reader, I'm glad they pulled the switcheroo. Is this kind of thing happening all the time? It, it, it does happen fairly uh, regularly. And I think 
you know, the only advice you can give a writer as an editor, sometimes they'll say, oh, I'm working on two different projects, and this one I've been working on for five years, mm. um, but then I just started this thing, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, and I'm really feeling on fire with that, but I feel like I really got to finish the first one, and I always tell them, abandon the first one, follow the one that you're actually interested in, because better writing will... Yeah. Will will come out of it. You can always come back around to something, but it's hard enough to be a writer. And if you don't have that sort of spark of interest, you're not going to generate good work. It's going to feel forced. Uh, and you don't want to get it stuck editing a whole book a writer's heart wasn't in that they dragged themselves through. I'm sure you've done. I'm sure you've 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 had that experience where you're about to edit something and you go through and it's like, oh, they didn't. They weren't into this. I don't want to do this. Yeah, and sometimes you just sort of feel like it. It's all there, but it doesn't quite have life. You want to sort of spank it, you know, and sometimes, you know, just to make it start breathing or something. But How often does that spanking work? Um, not that often. I mean, it's hard. It's, you know, editing isn't alchemy. You know, you can't, like, you know, inject life into something that doesn't in- inherently have it. You can um, coax out a spark sometimes if you can identify that spark. If you can identify that spark, that's the real core of the problem, then. Yeah, I think if you can't, then you shouldn't be editing that particular book. No, no, I mean, like, there, seriously, like, there are times when, um, I don't know, sometimes I'll, I'll get a submission of a novel. Novels are easiest to talk about this way, but, and I'll, and I'll think, oh, God, this person can really write, and, you know, there, there's really something interesting, but the book is, it's, is a fucking mess, and I don't, the, and, and, and sometimes I'll say, Oh, I, I have no idea how to fix it because I don't know what it's. I don't quite know what it's about. And then, even though I might identify talent, I might think somebody else is going to be really successful with this because there's something really special here. I've kind of got to reject it or give it to one of my colleagues and say, "Do you do you see something here?" Mm-hmm. On the flip side, sometimes I'll read something that's really good and it's a mess, and I'll feel like I know exactly what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 then that's the where you then want to have a conversation with an author. Um, and make sure you're talking about the same book, because <laughs> that because you know trouble if you're not. Yeah, trouble because then you're not going to have a good editorial relationship. But um, so uh, so usually it's just yeah you 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 want to make sure that you're kind of on the same frequency with the author and the book, and then you can have a really great um, editorial relationship. And sometimes that can be radical revisions. Some that, sometimes that can be you know just kind of fairly standard ones. I've been speaking in San Francisco's Mission District with Ethan Nazowski. He is the editorial director at McSweeney's, formerly of Ferrar Strauss and Giroux and Grey Wolf Press. Ethan, thanks so much for taking the time today. Sure. Thank you, Colin. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everyone who backed this season on Kickstarter. Danny Bolson, Brad and Laramie on Movies, Paul Doyle, Umberto Grant, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Mary Gillander, Eric Graham, Will Graham, John French, Andrew Philippon Jr., Kimberly Hahn, Chris Kay, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Rebecca O'Malley, Michael O'Regan, Gail Poole, Blake Riley, Superfan Giovanni, Aidan Nullman, Adam Schaefer, Rob Schultz, Scott Schenker, Cam Smith, Kevin Smokler, Adam Sutherland, TSD, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.